Heavenly Father, I just thank you and praise you for giving us this time tonight. Lord, we give it all to you. We just give it all to you. And I just ask you, God, that you will anoint me one more time. Please let the mantle of teacher come and rest on me. Let me have the energy that is needful. Lord, let the, let the empowerment be there that is needful. But more than anything, Lord, it's the needful anointing. Let the anointing rest on me that I need for this night to bring forth what I truly do believe that you have put on my heart for this night for our hearts. So Lord, we open ourselves now to receive all that you have for us in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, um, during the last couple of months, uh, I have been revisiting uh, what I did as online posts a year ago when we were shut down by COVID and we could not have class and um, so by the grace of God, we already had the capability. Um, my home was my studio and um, I home share with my spiritual daughter, Kelly, and all of the camera equipment there. So from day one, we were able to begin filming at home and then getting that to Jackie or to Ashley and they would upload it to get it out to um, everyone and we realized quickly that it was going far beyond um, our the the normal number of people who would be attending class um, because um, God just opened up doors through uh, the online posting that had not been opened before and praise God a number a lot of people have continued to stay with us since that time amen so um, this particular lesson is the last topic that I will be revisiting from a year ago. And as I went through this a few days ago, and then I went through it again today, I was like, oh God, <laughs> I'm not sure I completely got all that I needed to get from this a year ago. And it's been good for me to revisit and I think it might be good for you as well. And the title is From Why to How. From Why to How. Um, we have been dealing in the United States with COVID for 13 months now. For 13 months. Who would have ever thought that 13 months later, we would still be dealing with this, honestly. I mean, I, I remember in the beginning when I was absolutely confident that, you know, we were gonna be over and through this thing in a month and, you know, all was gonna be well. I mean, we have been shocked and we have been rocked in, in this time. And um, it's, it's like um, we have had to learn how to live COVID life, right? COVID life. How, how do we live COVID life? And the, the title of, of this is From Why to How. I cannot even, it, it, it boggles my mind and terrifies me a little bit to think about how many times in the last 13 months, forget all the years before coming to COVID, that I have literally asked God, why? I mean, uh, why? Why is this happening? Why are the decisions being made that are being made? To me, some seem logical, some seem crazy. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And it's been that way from the beginning of this. And, and as you realize that, and you just think about it in the United States, from state to state, city to city, county to county, different decisions being made about what to do and how to do it. And, you know, it's like, is this arbitrary? Is, you know, how are these decisions even being made? And why is this happening? Why are decisions being made as they're being made? And here's one, why would a good God allow such a thing to happen? Now, if you 
didn't ever think that, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> but um, if you're saying you never did, it might be liar, liar, pants on fire, okay? Because why would a good God allow what is happening in this world to be happening? Um, a year ago, uh, two articles came to me as a, as a year ago when we were weeks into this, not even, I was asking all of these questions. And two articles came to me, and I'm going to share from both of them tonight. One was from Guidepost, and um, then there was, there's another one later on that I will share from you. But how many of you are familiar with the book of Job in the Bible? Let me see your hands. Okay. The book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's believed to be the oldest book in the Bible. Of course, it's Old Covenant. This is before Jesus, before the Messiah. And it's quite interesting what happens in Job's life because Job was a God-fearing man. Job was a, a godly man. And Job comes under huge testing huge testing and it was n these were not things that god was doing to job and you've got to be absolutely clear when you read this what was happening in joe's life was coming from the enemy of his soul and you understand you have that same enemy however god did allow it he allowed it in Job's life. And if you read the whole story to the end, you see what amazing things happen in Job's life as he begins to make his way from why has this happened to how is this going to affect my life now? And how can God receive glory from this? And in the end, Job is abundantly blessed, blessed more than he ever was going into it. But Job is, is interesting. You see, um, I'm prone, I'm as prone as anyone to ask God why. Why is this happening to him? Why is this happening to her? Why is this happening to you? Why is this happening to you? Why must there be suffering? Why, why is there suffering? Why at times does it seem that, that my prayers for healing aren't being answered when I know that the Lord Jesus is still the healer? Amen? I know what his word says, that he forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. I know Jesus is still the healer. Why the delay? Why, why do my prayers for healing seem to go, seem, you hear the word, seem to go unanswered? Why would people who help so many others find themselves in places where they suddenly become helpless? Why, why, Bobby, are you here and not on the mission field? In Belgium, right? And and here and here, why is Europe opening? I hear today, and Anna, who usually is here, is in the same position. She's here from another country, okay? And I hear today that country's totally closed, going backward, even. Why? Why? Why are some countries hit so hard? by COVID. The truth of it is, we have fair questions. These are fair questions. They're reasonable. But asking God why seldom if ever <laughs> results in an answer. Did you hear what I said? We can ask why all we want, and we usually do not ever get the answer why. The Bible tells the story of Job 
who suffered great loss and pain and repeatedly sought an answer to the question, why? Well, God eventually answered, of course, but not as Job wanted. Job wanted an explanation. God declined to explain and instead started asking Job questions. And if you read the Gospels, if you read Jesus, one of his main pathways toward ministering to people was asking them questions. Because it forces us to think, right? Forces us to evaluate. I'm going to read you some scripture from Job 38, 1 through 13, and then 16 through 18 from the New International Version. So after Job asking God over and over and over and over again, what about this? What about that? Why this? Why that? And he was in a really difficult, suffering, hard place. Here's God, how God answers. Job 38, starting at 1. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know, exclamation point. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone? You think that from those first few words, Job's perspective is starting to change. While the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy, who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther, here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Yeah, wow. God never answered Job's why questions. God repeatedly and at length pointed out that his wisdom and his experience so far surpassed Job's earthly perspective that a satisfactory explanation was impossible. Not because of God's limitations, who has none, but because of Job's. Are you with me? Okay. The story shifts, however, when Job says, Surely, I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Therefore, I repent in dust and ashes. Job 42. That is, Job discovered a better question than why. It is a question God is far more likely to answer, which is, what now? Not God, you owe me an explanation, but God, how, how should I respond to this? Are you with me? I mean, I, the, I can relate so much to this, trying to get God to explain to me why things are, ha I'm a very logical person. I'm a highly analytical person. I want things to make sense right? I want them explained to me. And this is so, uh, this, this just resonates in me still. Now, one year later, listen, when we're treated unfairly, it's natural to feel self-pity and ask, why God? Why God? 
the name of this ministry is Help for Hurting Women. It's for women who are hurting or people who are hurting, men as well. And, and so often that comes from broken trust. People who have hurt us or are hurting us. When I'm treated unfairly, it's natural to feel self-pity and ask, why God? But when I pray instead, what now, God? He shows me how to respond with self-sacrifice instead of self-pity. When a loved one falls ill or dies, I tend to curse the darkness, asking, why God? But when I pray, what now? He often helps me (laughs) light a candle and find ways to ease the suffering of others. How I have lived this in my life. When my plants crumble in my hands, I quickly respond with frustration and ask, why God? But when I pray, what now God? He tenderly but firmly suggests a new plan, how to go about it, and often calls out of me new strength, new determination, New resiliency. So try it. Go ahead and ask why. Who knows? Maybe you'll get a better answer than Job. But let that question lead to the better one. What now and how? Can you say amen? I mean, I have realized that there were things in me, good things in me, in this last year that I didn't even know were in there. I have realized that there was an ability within me to be not only resilient, but highly flexible. (laughs) Highly flexible. How many of you have learned that during these times, you needed to be flexible beyond any way you've ever been flexible before, right? Okay. So going on to this next one, the, the previous one was an excerpt from guidepost traditional lovely wonderful old guidepost magazine this one comes from uh, a lady some of you may be very familiar with it's uh, laura story laura story and it's why god why when we ask why god why the answer to our whys may be obvious now or they may never be answered in our lifetime But even if we knew why, it's likely we wouldn't be satisfied with the answers anyway. We ask God why. Somehow believing the answer will provide us with some kind of deep soul satisfaction. But too often, we don't get the answer we want. I don't think that means we should give up asking questions. We just need to understand the role of questions in our brokenness. Questions can be a great help in mourning, loss, communicating frustration, and expressing our feelings. Nothing wrong with questions. We belong to an almighty, transcendent, yet totally approachable God who loves hearing our questions. He, we've, I've taught it. He's the omni one, right? <laughs> he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's all loving. He's completely sovereign, right? And he, our questions do not throw him. They don't throw him. So there's nothing wrong with asking the questions. Our questions are important to him. And the scriptures are full of hurting people asking questions. Just look at the Psalms. David wrote many of them when he was broken. And in them, he poured out some painful and intimate questions. Sometimes David got answers. Sometimes he got silence. But even when David's questions weren't answered, his faith in God was stronger than his need to know. Our faith in God, that's a good one to write down, our faith in God needs to be stronger than our need to know. Just like David, 
My why questions allow me to go before my Heavenly Father and pour out my heart to him. They help me process what I'm going through. Now, what are some of your why questions? Have you ever talked to God about them? Okay. What are some of your why questions? She says in this devotional, I want you to take a a minute and get a pen and a piece of paper, and then I want you to write down all your why questions. Well, that could take a while. (laughs) Starting with, Why did this happen? Or why me? Then get more specific. Try to remember each of those why questions that have kept you awake at night. For some of you, it may be a single why question that has plagued you for years. For others, it may be a long list of whys that have changed as often as your circumstances. Don't try to answer them until you've exhausted your list of questions. Some of you may be sitting here thinking, I don't think I could ever exhaust my list of questions. So, but what she says is, if you decide to do this, her evaluation is, how did you feel when you wrote down your white questions? Was it a relief? Or did it make you angry to put your whys on paper? Were your why questions answered? (laughs) Or did most of your questions go unanswered? Yeah, me too. It's important to know that nowhere does the Bible promise that all our questions will be answered on this side of heaven. Nowhere is it promised. And the truth of it is, I think, with a whole lot of our questions, when we get to heaven, we're really not going to care anymore. We're not going to care anymore. Now, some of these why questions are huge to us. Others we have to evaluate in the scope of eternity. How much does this even matter? I mean, we have to be honest about a lot of things. She says, God doesn't promise our stories will make sense in and of themselves, and we all have a story. But he does promise that they will find their greater purpose in light of his greater story of redemption, right? There's something always covering over our story. If I am honest, I find that as I look at at my list, she says, there's a sense of peace that comes from owning my own whys. But at the same time, I've discovered that the the longer I focus on why, the less progress I make. When I continue to ask why, somewhere in deep inside me, the repeated questioning and lack of answers feeds a sense of entitlement. And when that sense of entitlement grows, it usually leads to bitterness. Entitlement, what's that mean? I have a right to know. God ought to be telling me. God ought to be explaining this to me. God knows, why won't he explain it to me, right? But there is an alternative. The disciples asked, and we're going to go to John chapter 9, why was this man born blind? In this question, they were asking why for all of us. But in his answer, Jesus didn't respond directly to the why. Instead, He changed the why question to how. So turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to John chapter 9. I'm going to read a long passage of scripture here, starting at verse 1. I'm going to read it from the Passion Translation, because the further I went, I was like, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's really good, too. This is good. Okay. So basically, Jesus said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Are you getting this? Why? Why the blindness? Because it then led to the healing, and the works of God were displayed 
in the man? How might this man's blindness be used to reveal the work of God? Just as surely as he turned water into wine, Jesus turned the disciples' blame-seeking why question into a God-seeking how question. And that's good to write down. Okay? We need to let Jesus turn our blame-seeking why questions into God-seeking how questions. Are you with me? Man asks why. Jesus asks how. Man asks, why did this happen? Jesus asks, how might my Father's glory be displayed through the situation? John 9, starting at verse 1. Afterward, as Jesus walked down the street, he noticed a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, teacher, whose sin caused this guy's blindness, his own or the sin of his parents? They already had determined, right, that his blindness was the result of sin, so it was either his or it was his parents. Jesus answered, neither. It happened to them so you could watch him experience God's miracle. Whoa. While I'm with you, it's daytime, and we must do of God who sent me while the light shines. For there's coming a dark night when no one will be able to work. As long as I am with you, my life is the light that pierces the world's darkness. Now get this. Get this. Then Jesus spat on the ground, made some clay with his saliva. Yipe stripes. Then he anointed the blind man's eyes with clay and he said to the blind man, now go and wash the clay from your eyes in the ritual pool of Siloam. Next line, so he went and he washed. Sounds so simple, except for the fact that tradition tells us clearly that this healing took place up at the Temple Mount, okay? That's where this happened. That's where Jesus was ministering. And Jesus sent him all the way down through the city of David, many of us has been there, all the way down through town, town, narrow streets, all the way down to the Pool of Siloam. He's not only blind, but now he's got mud on his eyes. Can you imagine just making his way through, hitting people, the ridicule? Can you even imagine I mean, it, it blows my mind. He said to the blind man, now go and wash the clay from your eyes in the ritual pool of Siloam. And then, and then simplistic, so he went and he washed. And as he came back, he could see for the first time in his life. Oh, hallelujah. Amen? He obeyed. Yeah, how many times has God told us to do something? And rather than simply doing it, we come back with all the whys. Why do I have to do it? Why do I have to do it this way? Why do I have to do it at this time? Why does it really matter? Can't God do it anyway if I don't do this? How many times? Well, this caused quite a stir among the people of the neighborhood, for they noticed that the blind beggar was now seeing. This is part of the how, right? Now they're all seeing what has happened. They began to say to one another, isn't this the blind man who once sat and begged? Some said, no, can't be him. Others said, but it looks like him. It has to be him. And all the while the man kept insisting, I'm the man who was blind. And finally they asked him, well, what's happened to you? And he replied, I met the man named Jesus. He rubbed clay in my eyes and said, go to the pool of Siloam and wash. So I went, and while I was washing the clay from my eyes, I began to see for the very first time ever. So the people of the neighborhood inquired, inquired, well, where is this man? I have no idea, the man replied. So the people marched him over to the Pharisees to speak with them. They're concerned because the miracle Jesus performed by making clay with his saliva and anointing the man's eyes happened on a Sabbath day, a day that no one was allowed to, in quotes, work. Wow, 
So now we see the religious spirit. Then the Pharisees asked the man, how did you get your sight restored? And he replied, a man anointed my eyes with clay and then I washed and now I can see for the first time in my life. Then an argument broke out among the Pharisees over the healing of the blind man on the Sabbath. Some said this man who performed this healing is clearly not from God. He doesn't even observe the Sabbath. Another says, if Jesus is just an ordinary sinner, how could he perform a miracle like that? He's stirring everything up, right? He's stirring everything up. This prompted them to turn on the man healed of blindness, putting him on the spot in front of them all, demanding an answer. And they ask, who do you say he is, this man who opened your blind eyes? And the guy says, well, he's a prophet of God still refusing to believe that the man had been healed and was truly blind from birth, the Jewish leaders called for the man's parents to be brought to them. So they asked his parents, is this your son? Yes, they answered. Was he really born blind? Yes, he was, they replied. So now we got the parents, right? Think of all the people who are being touched by this. So they pressed his parents to answer. Then how is it that he's now seeing? Here's a good, honest answer. We have no idea. <laughs> we don't know what happened to our son. Ask him. He's a mature adult. He can speak for himself. Now, the parents were obviously intimidated by the Jewish religious leaders, for they had already announced to the people that if anyone publicly confessed Jesus as the Messiah, they would be excommunicated. And that's why they told them, ask him. He's an adult. He can speak for himself. So once again, they summoned the man who was healed of blindness and said to him, swear to God <laughs> to tell us the truth. We know the man who healed you is a sinful man. Do you agree? And the healed man replied, I have no idea what kind of man he is. All I know is I was blind. And now I can see for the first time time in my life. And then he says to them, what did he do to you? <laughs> uh, you know, and, and they're saying, well, how did he heal you? And the man responded, I told you once and you didn't listen to me. Why do you make me repeat it? <laughs> and then sarcastically, are you wanting to be his followers too? <laughs> and this angered the Jewish leaders. And they heaped insults on him. And I really don't think he cared. We can tell you, we can tell you are one of his followers. And now we know it. We are true followers of Moses. For we know that God spoke to Moses directly. But as for this one, we don't know where he's coming from. <laughs> and the man says, well, what a surprise this is. I just love this translation. What a surprise this is, the man says. You don't even know where he comes from. But he healed my eyes, and now I can see. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but only to godly people who do his will. Yet who has ever heard of a man born blind that was healed and given his eyesight for the very first time. I tell you, if this man isn't from God, he wouldn't be able to heal me like he has. Well, some of the Jewish leaders were enraged and said, just who do you think you are to lecture us? You were born a blind, filthy sinner. So they threw the man out in the street. And let me pause here to say to you, as you become healed from whatever hurts that you have, and God begins to transform you, there will be people in your life who have known you for a long time who will not believe it. They will not believe that you're really different. They won't. Don't let them steal from you what God is doing in bringing you to wholeness. Can you say amen? Who do you think you are to lecture us? You were born a blind, filthy sinner. 
So they threw the man out in the street. And when Jesus learned that they had thrown him out, he went to find him and said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And the man whose blind eyes were healed answered, Who is he, Master? Tell me, so I can place all my faith in him. And Jesus replied, You're looking right. You're looking. You're seeing. You're looking right at him. He's speaking with you. It's me, the one in front of you now. And then the man threw himself at his feet and worshiped Jesus and said, Lord, I believe in you. Can you say amen? Can you say amen? What a lesson these disciples received. After asking the question, why is this man blind? Who sent, him or his parents? Jesus says, neither. Now watch this, right? Watch this. Watch how this unfolds. Look at how God will receive glory from, from all of this. And the answer to why doesn't help us heal. But knowing that God's glory can be displayed even in the brokenness of our lives gives us hope despite our circumstances. I promise you will find more purpose and joy in your life if you set aside the why and begin to ask how. Begin to ask how. Those of you who know my life, we lost a little girl in the early years of our marriage, our little Kimmy, who was 10 years old, to acute lymphocytic leukemia. She got it when she was three. She went into remission. Five years, doing extremely well, and then relapsed. And in two years, she was gone. She was gone. Going through that time, we probably asked God a hundred times, why? Why this little girl? And yet, when I look back, I can tell you now, it was her life and the way she handled that time, and we didn't know anything about praying for healing. We didn't know anything about that. But we had returned to God, sort of, kind of, I had. But then I saw this little girl going through this, dying, preparing to go to heaven. And I knew. I didn't know Jesus. I had been born and raised in church. I did not know Jesus the way this little girl knew Jesus. And I rededicated my life then. And my husband, who had gone to Lutheran church all his life, had the 12 years of pins of perfect attendance in Lutheran Sunday school, had never been born again, but was because of her life. Because of her life. How God used it to work in his life and to live in my life. It took a long time for us to go from the wise to actually coming to, okay, God, we're letting that go. How do you want to work this in our lives? Same thing happened with me with my husband. Most of you in this room know. I mean, May 19th of 2008, I'm in, I'm in Israel. I'm baptizing people in the Jordan River. My husband's back here at home. He's just fine. And at that moment that I'm baptizing people, my husband dies. And he goes to be with the Lord. We'd been married 35 years. He was my best friend my lover, my heart, my husband, and he's gone. He's gone. Do you not think that I did not ask God a thousand times why? Including God, why literally does he get to go to heaven and I have to stay here? I mean, I ask it straight out. This isn't fair. This isn't right. Why does he get to do this and I have to stay here? But time passed, 
And praise God, it wasn't at that moment that I began to come to know God. I had come to know God a long time before that. And it just began to settle in the reality that, listen, if I'm not in heaven and I'm here, God clearly still had a purpose for my life. Amen? He clearly still had a purpose. And I had to get myself from facing life to embracing life so that I could go ahead into what it is that God had for me, including standing here right this moment. Right? I mean, I had to get this right. It could have destroyed me. It could have destroyed me. I know many, many people where that sort of loss has destroyed them. Women, listen to me. Listen to me. I had, quote, Christian women line up to tell me I would grieve for the rest of my life and I would never get over it. And they thought they were helping me. They thought they were helping me that I just needed to accept it. I just needed to accept it and just accept that I was going to be miserable and grieving for the rest of my life. Them never realizing that Isaiah 53 says, he took our griefs to Calvary. Amen? He carried them. The word is NASA, carried them away at Calvary. And now, my mother, I mean, my mother, what my mother wants is to be in heaven, period, end of story. That's what she wants. But her eyesight is failing, her hearing is failing, her mind is challenged. She wants to be in heaven, but she's not. She's not. And do you not think that I have not asked God a few times a week? Why? Why? That answer's not going to come. It's not going to come. That is a futile question. The question needs to be, God, how do you want to work in me? How do you want to work through me? How do you want to use her in this time? Are you, if you're kind of with me, can you wave at me? Okay. When people go through heartache, um, we sometimes know what they're going through. We sometimes don't. Um, we want answers, and we don't get them. All I can tell you is that our faithful and compassionate God allows us to ask any question we want, no matter how difficult, but don't lose another day of your life asking unproductive why questions. When the time is right, just move forward by asking how. How do you want me to live? What do you want me to do with this, God? What do you want me to do with this? If there's one thing that, my, that the loss of my husband taught me, and it taught me a lot, but one thing it taught me was that um, I have to understand that during the difficult times, God not only wants me to see himself, he wants me to see myself as well. He wants me to honestly evaluate how it is that I am dealing with the hurts in my life, and am I going to let them debilitate me and continue to debilitate me, or Am I going to allow God to take me on to something that he obviously still has for me because I'm still here, right? And what God, what, it, one thing that my husband, my husband seized the day, every day, he seized the day. And it surely taught me when he was so quickly gone, you only have today. You only have today. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? 
Are you going to throw it away or are you going to seize the day? And there are times, even in the midst of our days, when we just need to stop and we need to say, God, it just uh, how is it that you want me to deal with what is happening? What is it that you want me to do that others will see? God is good. He knows what, with his help, we can handle and where we most need to see him work. You know, it's easy to sign up for a short-term mission trip or to donate money to some worthy cause or something wonderful going on at the church. And it's true. We can see God working in those places. But would you be willing to sign up for the brokenness in your life if you knew that your brokenness would bring glory to God and enable you to learn to trust him in everything. You see, that's what the walls of our heart teaching is all about. Coming to a place of saying, I don't want you to be walled out anymore, Lord, because of my hurts. I want to let you in. I want my brokenness to matter for something. And the only way that happens is when we allow ourselves to be broken and open before God. And then he comes. You see, we're tempted to measure our circumstances on the world's scales, but God uses different size scales. His story is so much bigger than ours, and we all have a story. And one day, when we see it in totality, we'll have all the answers that we really desire. The myth is contentment begins when we understand why. That's the myth. The truth is, contentment begins with asking how God might use this situation for his glory. Can you say amen as we go from why to how? Amen? If you would just bow your heads. Lord, I am absolutely, completely positive with every single person in this room and everyone that's watching me or listening right now that we have all kind of done a why review. Not just of the last year as we have dealt with COVID, but of our lives, of our lives. Those hurts, those losses, those broken, broken promises, those times the trust has been broken in our lives, those challenges that seem so incredibly beyond our capability. We all, we all ask why. But Lord, I'm asking you tonight that we will begin to gain another fresh perspective that the truth of it is, there's a how in this. How can you receive glory from our lives? How can you receive glory from the circumstances in our lives that we absolutely cannot explain? Now, just like that man who was blind from birth and Jesus healed him, what was the whole purpose Oh, yes, his seeing naturally was awesome. But what was more amazing than that was that he began to see Jesus with spirit eyes. He saw him as the Savior. He saw him as the one that he desperately needed. And it didn't matter what anybody else had to say about it. 
and that may be right where you are tonight. I don't know everyone in this room, but I sure do know the Lord. And I know that he is longing, longing for you to accept him into your heart, into your life. You were created in his image. He loves you, and he longs to live in you. How amazing that Jesus came to this earth, God incarnate, lived a sinless life here, died for our sins, but it didn't end there. Resurrected and alive, this same Jesus that we read about in John chapter 9. So if you need to accept Jesus into your heart tonight, or you need to wholeheartedly rededicate your life to him, every part, no parts held back, would you just raise your hand until I see it, and we will pray in this room if there's anyone. If it's you online, do it. Do it now. Jesus, I accept you. As my Savior, I make you Lord of my life. Forgive me of every way I failed you. Wash me clean. Jesus, you are mine, and I am yours for now and forever. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone in this room, and I ask you to take us from this place from huge angels on guard round about us, and I ask you, Lord, that you will aim on us to do a very honest evaluation. What, what are those things in our lives, perhaps past, perhaps right now, where we just continue to ask the why and it's getting us nowhere. And it's time to go from the why to God. How, how do you want me to handle this? How can you get glory from this? So take us from this place, Lord, considering this seriously. I ask you, Lord, for sweet sleep, and I ask you, God, that as we make our way through days to come, that we will be totally open to all that you want to do in us and through us, in Jesus' name. Can you say amen? Can you give him praise?